to talk about use cases today. Since I think everybody knows me, has a rough idea about OFP, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it. I think AJ did a pretty good job. Thank you, AJ, for going through all that, I think, this morning. And we'll obviously spend a few more, few more uh, days over the next couple of weeks to, uh, our uh, next couple of days to talk through more of like where we advance this a bit. So, all right. Um, what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time talking about like where, where I see OFP in terms of use cases. So I, I will fully apologize. Some of you guys heard this at the bar last night. You're going to go on a bit of a journey with me this morning because I, I wanted to give you a little bit of like how I think about OFP in terms of use cases and standards. So, um, but but uh, a little bit of history of myself. So I've been in sort of sustainability for about 25 years, right? And one of the reasons I, I joined PwC is I, I'm a firm believer that sustainability should be operationalized. It should be the way we think about it. If you think about digital, right? Like if you think about like, let's go 10 years back, digital was a thing that was out there that was sort of separate. And we always thought about how we integrate digital. Whereas now, if you think about how we operate in our day-to-day -day lives, digital is just core to how we work, right? It works with our phones. It works with how we interact with our people, with our colleagues, with our family, et cetera. It's just, it's just the way that we work. And my own personal philosophy around this is around that sustainability should be operationalized. It should just be the way that we work, right? And by sustainability, by the way, I mean by whatever definition you're defining sustainability, right? Um, I have some personal views. I have some personal passions that I believe in. Equally, I'm sure others do as well, right? And so I'm, once again, I'm not going to define today as to whether those passions align or not. But really, from my perspective, is really kind of like, how do, how do we operationalize? So anyways, long story short, as I start to think about how can we operationalize sustainability and, and why we think about OFP and why I personally think about OFP. So yes, for those of you who uh, wonder why I do do this, uh, like for me, it is a personal thing. And I, and I do it for, because I think there is a huge opportunity to unlock some values. So first and foremost, transparency and verifiability. I think everybody who's at least heard me talk once has heard me talk about my, my 1099 example, right? Like, um, and I, I'll use it again and again just because it's, a, you know, it was close to April 15th. By the way, if you haven't done your taxes, you're pretty much screwed at this point, unless you got an extension. Um, but I come back to, I get my 1099 and I don't ever doubt it, right? Like, and, and some of you have heard me that because there's that transparency, there's a verifiability to it. There's a whole ecosystem that's been built around it that I don't even see, right? It just happens. Like somewhere I know it exists because I've, I've seen some of the back parts of it just because in my role in the firm, but I know that exists, right? Like somewhere I go do a trade, it gets logged somewhere, it does something to it, some auditors look at it, somewhere I get a form. Now it's electronic, so I don't even have to get the paper form. I just download it and all I do is I go send it to my tax guy and they, they do wondrous things with it and I fill out a form and I write a check, right? But that, but that whole ecosystem exists to provide transparency and verifiability to it. In all fairness, I don't actually understand all the transparency behind it, because when I look at the form, I'm like, OK, I really don't understand half the things that it says on there, but that's a different issue. OK. Um, share information at a lower cost. As I think about this, I, I mean, I've been a sustainability IT professional for almost a quarter of a century now. And I think about the cost it took me to integrate a decade ago, or you know, two decades ago to some extent, versus the cost of it now, right, with the likes of an OFP data model. Because ideally, with that data model, we can now talk about it in a common taxonomy, right? Like the way I store my global warming potentials would be the same way as John stores them, or the way as Sal stores them, or however it might be, but at least we've got a common way of doing it. And what does that mean? Well, that means that I can share my information with you in a much easier perspective because we have a common taxonomy, right? Drive a complete picture of impacts. This is actually kind of one of my new, one of the things we'll talk about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today right now talking about it because you'll see it in my example. Um, but now as I look through OFP, it's an interesting observation. You can now start to compare apples to apples and side by side. Uh, we did a roundtable um, as PwC with uh, a couple of our clients, and we actually we took the scope three emissions for three of my large technology companies, right? So whatever they report on CDP or in any of the publicly available or their public reports, I can't remember where, where all we got it, but we got their data. And if you were to stack their 15 categories side by side, we actually did this by Lego, by the way. We, we took up Lego bricks and represented the stacks of them. It's, they're very different. Like, it's interesting. If you go take Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, just, just not to name them out or anything, but just if you, if you take those three and compare their 15 categories side by side, they look very different as a profile, right? Why? 
And that was, that's one of the questions that's been burning through my head, right? And once again, I'm not expecting an answer today, but how are they accounting for some things versus other things? Or is it complete? Is it not? And so once again, I'm starting to think about what's the complete impact of uh, complete picture of the impacts. And obviously, we're going to talk a lot about analytics this week, but I'm a firm believer there is a value around analytics. And, and by the way, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the societal benefits of sustainability. I, I do believe in that personally, but equally to me, the reason I do this because there is business value. Um, I had the fortune of spending a week at the Harvard Business School uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was interesting to see how many executive leaders actually think about sustainability as unlocking business value, how they transform their business, how they use it as a vehicle for disruption to create new business models, right? And that's, if you notice, I use those terms specifically because there is a different way of thinking about this in addition to the societal benefit, all right? So th these are the things that sort of go through my head as I think about OFP and as I think about how we can unlock stuff in, in terms of uh, the values, okay? All right. Won't spend a lot of time. I'm thinking pretty much everybody in this room has seen this. This is my sort of standard ecosystem. Like, where do I see OFP? Everything I see in a green hexagon is where I where I think we there is an opportunity for OFP to play. Okay. This slide, I think, as AJ kind of showed, is is one of the slides I've been thinking about. So, at, at a very simplistic level, where does OFP play? Right. Well, if I think about it, if I'm person A, company A, party A, and I'm sending information to party B, whatever that might be, right? It could be your business unit sending data to corporate. It could be your supplier sending information to you. It could be me sending data to John just because I'm bored and I want to do it. Um, I was thinking about it actually in the context of, of, of the open group. What is the carbon footprint for this, this, this conference? Don't ask me why I was thinking about it. It just popped into my head. Uh, but I was thinking about that. And so how do I send the information? So if you think about OFP once again, right? And once again, I won't go into a lot of detail around this, but if you notice, like if I'm trying to send information from A to B, somewhere I need my, my, my middleman, right? And so the way I've been thinking about it, just once again, I use Quicken as my example, right? So for those of you who don't use Quicken, that's what I use to track my finances. But when I go into like, you know, my, my bank sites, right? I go to my credit card sites, I go to my bank sites, I can download a file. Doesn't matter which bank site it is. There's, I could use the same bank as Sal, I could use a different bank than, than Chris over there, but it doesn't matter but I can download the file, it automatically uploads it. I don't have to think about it, right? Um, if I had my water bottle, same kind of concept, right? There's, the data is interoperable. And the benefit of something like an OFP is it makes that interoperability happen, right? I don't have to think about it because notionally we've spent a lot of time collectively thinking about it to make sure that that data does flow. And once again, is the OFP data model perfect? No, I'm sure there's lots of things that we can find to identify to fix it, okay? All right, so that's the context that I'm going to give you before I get into my use case discussion. I promise I will get into some use cases. So we're going to take a, a little bit of a journey. Once again, I fully apologize for everybody who has to go through this journey with me, but welcome to my world. Um, I wanted to take a simplistic use case, right? Um, for those of you who know me, uh, I love flying. I love everything about flying. Uh, it's actually my two favorite places to be are in an airport and an airplane. Yes, I need therapy. I probably need to go be sent somewhere. Uh, but I really do, because to me, I'm truly amazed at a thing that is, you know, flies at 39,000 feet in the air, has all the creature comforts, and it's negative, I don't know, whatever, 50 degrees up in the air, and it lands at 120 degrees and takes off at like 30, you know, negative 40, for example. And it does that with incredibly high reliability. And so I'm amazed by everything about an airplane. Really am. I love the experiences. I love having the conversations. Yes, I'm one of those weird people that talks to people on the next to you on the plane. I don't do it that often, so don't worry. If you get sat next to me, I will shut up. Um, but I was thinking about it today. I was like, okay, well, as I think about this simplistic use case, what's my emissions for my flight? How does OFP fit? And why do I use this? Because on one hand, I probably should reduce my carbon footprint. I will fully admit this. I take this as a personal mission about myself. On the other hand, I am truly miles obsessed, right? I will fully admit this about, this, about myself, right? So I, like, just to give you perspective, I'm, I'm a lead on four airlines, right? So that's, that's a significant amount of flights that I take on, a, on an annual basis. For those of you who know me, I'm rarely in the same city on any given week. And a lot of times I'm in two or three cities in a week because that's what my job I will say it doesn't require me of it. I do volunteer for a lot of these trips, uh, in all fairness. But it's partially because I do enjoy it. 
But also, as I take a step back, I go, okay, if I really want to contribute to this, I want to contribute in a meaningful way that enables me to do what I do enjoy doing, which is flying. But now, how do I think about it in the context of OFP? So if I come back and I sit back and I go, okay, what are the, what's the impact? What's the carbon emissions to count the carbon for my flight? So most people, you can just, you can do a simple average, right? You can go to Google, if you go Google flights, you search your flight, you look at it, um, and you'll, you'll find your emissions. If you go to any of your travel and expense uh, systems, we, you know, whether it's Kayak or Concur or Expedia or whatever you guys use, you'll see CO2 emissions, right? But it's based on a basic average, right? And I have a hard time with this one, not, not because I disagree with the number. I, I understand why the number exists, right? It's not that I doubt the verifiability of the number, because once again, I've seen how the math is done, and I've got a rough level of confidence on it, but I don't like the number. Not because it's wrong. I actually think it's incomplete, right? And it's incomplete from a number of different perspectives, which I'll, I'll share in a second. Yes, there'll be a conversation around salads at some point during this conversation, so don't worry, I won't freak you out too much about it as we get into the quantify. But also, I'm thinking about it from, how does it actually help me with my decision making, right? So if I come back to use cases, ultimately we're all here because we think that dealing something with carbon and data models is gonna add business value to our organizations, right? Fundamentally, that's, you know, that is why we're here. So in my head, I'm sitting there going, okay, how does this help me make better decisions about what I want to do, right? So once again, I can find my missions by searching for the flight. Yeah, that's easy. So, oh, sorry. I broke this down in my head, by the way. Yes, I had a long flight over. Um, this is actually literally what went through my head over the last like probably three or four days. Um, and actually a lot longer than that just because I've been flying a fair amount. Um, I broke it down into four things. You can break down to five, you can break down to six, doesn't matter, you can break it down to one. I said, okay, well, how would I use OFP in these four particular boxes? How do I decide what flight that I'm gonna select? Sorry, you're gonna get a bit of a journey on that too. How do I quantify the impacts? How do I communicate against the commitments that we've made as a firm and, and I personally believe in? And then how do I share this with customers and so on and so forth, right? Um, and the reason I wanted to kind of break through those four things is in my head, I'm, what I'm going to try to answer as we go through this or try to think through is where does OFP fit? Okay. So selecting the right flight. Um, I, by the way, of all the decisions I make, this is actually the most complicated thing in my life. Uh, because as you can imagine with the things that I try to consider as I bake every single flight. And yes, I appreciate this is a weirdness about me. Most people would just go to their admins and say, can you book me a flight to go from A to B? Yes, I could do that, but I have this perverse sickness about me that I says, I really like to pick a flight. I really like to get into the details of this. Um, I've also trained my assistant to actually, unfortunately, look at all this stuff, which uh, actually, he's now actually gotten a kick out of it. So, and by the way, I do the same thing with hotels, but for today, we'll just focus on the flight. So first of all, I gotta look at cost, right? It'd be really nice to fly, you know, whatever I want to and over and just completely forget about the cost, but I can't do that, right? There is a cost element. I have a budget that I've got to live with. Schedule, right? Uh, invariably for me to get here on a Monday morning, I've got to leave Sunday, which means I'm, I'm interrupting my family time. But I want to minimize that as much as possible so that I can get here early enough so that I, my day isn't completely shot but I don't want to leave so early that I'm interrupting the maximum amount of time I spend with my family, because once again, I'm on the road. So just to give you perspective, the average number of days I'm in the city of Houston counting weekends in any given month is about nine, right? So if you think about two thirds of the day, two thirds of every month, I'm on the road. So I highly value the days that I spend in Houston with my family and so on and so forth. Okay, CO2 impact. Right, so I am actually curious as to what my carbon emissions are. By the way, I'm not actually gonna tell you what my carbon emissions are, because I forgot to look it up and I actually can't remember the number anymore, so. Um, aircraft, yes, because I'm actually very fascinated by airplanes, so therefore I actually do look at what aircraft I fly, because it makes a big difference to me whether I fly a 777 or a 787 or an A380, an A220 or an A319, because they have different flight profiles, they have different characteristics about them, 
There's some aircraft that I haven't flown that I really enjoy. There's some seats that I like better than others. Yes, I'm completely obsessed about this. Um, I'm sorry. The route, uh, why am I obsessed about the route? Because once again, there's a few joys that I have in my life. Sometimes going to cities and airports, you gotta remember that I think about every city as an airport code, <laughs> right? I literally do. Um, there are some airport codes that I can't remember if I've been to. So in this particular case, just to kind of cut to the chase, my route to, to Edinburgh was Houston to Minneapolis to Amsterdam to Edinburgh. Okay? Was it the most direct route? Many of you live in the same city as I do, right? Many of you left Saturday to get here Sunday, likely flying United to Newark, Newark to Edinburgh. That's probably the most direct route. I could have flown that. It was about a couple grand more expensive, but eh, I don't want to leave Saturday because of my family issues, right? I hate to say this, I'm already like a leap for life on United. So at this point, I wanted to maximize my Delta miles. That's what the miles thing at the end is. So I'm trying to hit goal because for whatever reason, I had I got stuck in like checking with the regular, uh, like regular line and Delta. So therefore, this was a big problem for me. So I wanted to hit my goal sky priority in miles. Yes, once again, I admit I have issues, right? But once again, the reason I'm going through this is your companies are making decisions on a number of different criteria, right? And I am trivializing this a little bit just to bring it back to a personal level, but this is literally the decision-making process I go through for every single flight that I take, right? These six criteria, right? And the reason I bring that up is how does that now show up in my travel and expense system? So we use Kayak, right? We switch from Concur to Kayak. How does this now show up? Because yes, I can go into the system, it'll give me my miles. Right? It'll give me my flight. I can book the ticket. It'll tell me how much CO2. Where does that data go? Right? So if you think about it, right? I've now bought a third party system. Many of you have third party systems for, for travel expenses. Where does that data go? Right? Does it sit in Kayak? Does it sit in Concur? Do I have to build an integration from the PWC carbon accounting system into Kayak to go get that data? Um, does it automatically send it? Does it not? Uh, by the way, I got voted to uh, join PwC where we're re-looking at how we track our own corporate travel. We, we actually do track every flight. We've got all kinds of crazy statistics and around it. Um, but given the fact I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a frequent traveler, they decided I'd be a good test case to see how we can improve this process. And OFP, by the way, is, is, is central to this. Because as a large systems integrator and as someone who sits on a number of steering committees with software companies, I'm actually gonna go beat up a bunch of my software companies at the moment because I want that integration cost to be easier so that I can do the analytics easier to help me make a better decision on what flight to take based on my six decision criteria, right? And I know that sounds trivial, but once again, as I think about the cost of integration from data to go from A to B for my travel expense system into my corporate greenhouse gas system, that isn't trivial. I actually do know how much money we spend to go get that data. Yes, there's APIs and there's integration costs and all that kind of good stuff, but that means I have to go figure it out, right? And if Heidi has to go figure that out for the open group and Derek's got to figure it out for, for ConocoPhillips and Sal's got to go figure it out for ExxonMobil, we're doing that four times, right? Now, once again, can OFP help with that? Yes. Oh, by the way, forgot to mention, there's this whole thing called sustainable aviation fuel. There's these offsets. Well, where does that show up? Because we actually buy. We're, we're one of the largest corporate customers in the world of travel, right? Just if you imagine PwC, 300,000 people, we travel a fair amount as companies. We're one of the largest corporate customers of business travel. We personally believe, as a corporation, we go out and buy sustainable aviation fuel. We have our own allocations. I personally believe in it. I'd be happy to go write a check to somebody. There's actually some airlines that I fly where I can do that. How does the allocations from a sustainable aviation fuel that I buy on KLM get back allocated to my corporate travel system and my corporate accounting system for greenhouse gas? That I actually don't know the answer to. That's actually one of the things that, that actually started to bug the heck out of me because I got a question from one of my airline clients about SAF, right? So in my head, I'm sitting there going, okay, wait, hang on. I know somewhere in my airline world they're tracking the SAF that I'm using. It may not be on my direct flight, but somewhere there's an allocation, right? So somewhere there's an allocation. Oh, by the way, because we flew from US to Europe, the definition of SAF is different. 
regulatory, the definition of SAF in the U.S. is different from the definition of SAF in the EU. In the EU. Wait, the, the SAF did I buy, is that compliant with the SAF in the EU? I have no idea, right? So once again, as I'm thinking about OFP, I'm thinking about airline systems that are tracking the allocation. By the way, most, most airlines actually track this via like an Excel spreadsheet. There's some um, third-party products out there that, that, that actually do a pretty decent job of, of tracking this. But at the end of the day, how does this now back, show back up in PwC's greenhouse gas data system? By the way, this is all before I actually bought the flight. And the flight, by the way, I only bought about a week ago. Right, so this is just because I literally had no idea where I was going to be on Friday or Saturday or Sunday. So, um, anyways, so this is all before I go. Don't worry, I will get to the end of this chase. I'm gonna grab some water. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through this quick, so you, you can sort of see this. So now I'm, I'm quantifying my impacts. Right, so I got on the plane, I picked my flight, maximizing my delta miles. Fairly cheap. It was actually not the most expensive flight. It was actually a cheaper flight. Okay, great. I had to do two segments. It's not the end of the world. I left at 11 a.m. And my wife thought I was nuts because all day Saturday I couldn't tell you how excited I was to get on my flight. So I got on my flight. Love flying. Had a wonderful journey. I happened to talk to a guy next to me who's like director of regulatory affairs for an old client of mine. So we actually spent most of the afternoon talking on the flight over talking about uh, all things carbon and microplastics, which is a very interesting conversation to have on a seven hour flight across the Atlantic. Um, okay, cool. Quantifying the emissions. Here's my problem with the number that I get from Google and the, and the airlines and my travel expenses. It's scope one for the airline. It basically counts the fuel cost, right? Or distance, how are they do it, right? So depending on the airline, right? So it counts, I'm flying from A to B using this amount of fuel, this amount of distance, Okay, maybe it accounts for my fare class and so on and so forth, right? So it does basic math. How does the CO2 for my salad get accounted for? And Shruti, Shruti laughs at this because I actually literally went through this thought last night or actually over the course of the flight. So I had a wonderful salad, had uh, all kinds of citrus, pomegranates, had this lovely cucumber, some tomatoes. Okay, those come from four different farms, right? Just practically speaking. How is the CO2 for that salad accounted for when I booked my flight. And the reason this came up, by the way, as I was thinking about it, um, I happened to do some work for a client of mine in the, in the sort of agriculture business. So we're talking about like dairy farmers and, and other farmers. So we're thinking about how do we actually get their data, right? In this particular case, some organizations use surveys, some companies use blockchain. Yes, I use the dreaded B word. Doesn't matter, don't get, don't get fussed about the technology. But somewhere I'm collecting data from a bunch of farmers who just gave me the CO2 footprint of my, my pomegranates. By the way, lovely salad, really wonderful. Oh, there was a beet and radish too, somewhere in there. That was wonderful. Right, so here's all the stuff that's getting assembled into a salad. By the way, we haven't gone to the entrees, right? Mushroom ravioli and a bunch of other stuff. So there is a CO2 impact for every meal, every drink, everything that I've had on the plane that really isn't accounted for in that CO2 number when I book my flight. At least I don't think, right? By the way, this is literally what's still going through my head. Oh, supplies. So now think about everything that you load on a plane. Because it's not trivial, it's not just the fuel, right? You got paper products, you've got cups, you got plastic, you got a whole bunch of other stuff. So as you start to think about now, where, where is all that stuff stored, right? It's probably in some ledger system. I can probably go to KLM's you know, ledger system and go figure out where, what, how much money they spent and from where and so on and so forth, right? I can actually go figure that out. Okay, so I can now take that number and then quantify the emissions. Okay, but how's it coming back into PwC's greenhouse gas system? Because as I'm thinking about the CO2 impact of my flight, well, crap, now I gotta go get CO2 data from KLM in addition to Kayak, in addition to this poor farmer who apparently gave me wonderful pomegranates, and so on and so forth, right? So you can start to see my story starting to build up. Oh, um, airports. I just hit three airports in the course of a day. What about the CO2 impact of those airports? And the reason this comes up is uh, one of the airports I went still had um, diesel for the tow back trucks. And I hadn't, it's actually a lot of them have now switched to electric. So I was like, wait, hang on. How do I quantify the impacts of this CO2? So once again, where does OFP fit in this? in order to enable the airport to now communicate their CO2 impact for me. Okay. Oh, real-time performance. Had a flight delay. 
couple of weather bumpy things and so on and so forth. So we, we therefore had a, a flight optimized path that accounted for weather, which means that we probably burned more fuel than was average. So how do I reconcile that average number that I got in my, my booking with the actual real-time operational performance of the flight? Because, by the way, we have wonderful systems. Honeywell makes up a whole bunch of stuff sitting on a plane, have incredible amount of data that you can track. By the way, you can also look this up on flighttracker.com if you're really bored. Yes, I have that subscription to that, too, because when I'm not on a plane, I, I obsess about planes. Um, so I can track this stuff. But once again, that's not being accounted for in my greenhouse gas system because if I had a three-hour flight delay or we took a longer route or we had an emergency divert or if we actually caught a tailwind, my CO2 emissions would be more or less accurate than whatever the average number is. And some of you at this point are going, holy crap, I can't believe he goes to this much effort for one number, right? And I'm not saying that everybody should do this, by the way. I do it because it's my, hard, my, my largest carbon impact, right? That's why I'm doing it. For me, it has business value, right? And so on and so forth. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but this is literally some of the things I'm kind of going through my head. Once again, as you now think about this, oh, communicating against com commitments, right? So think about the greenhouse gas platform we have. Think about our project financial system, because when I book, you know, put my expense code in and my cost center and all that kind of stuff, it goes, my, 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 my flight and my cost go somewhere, right? And so on and so forth. Oh. Um, I've got a couple of customer meetings while I'm here. So theoretically, some of my CO2 emissions go to me attending an open group meeting. Still got to account for where that goes, right? Does it go to PwC's voluntary commitment? Does it go to our, if you think about just straight accounting, where does that go? Oh, and then which customers? So now I got to go back to my CRM system to figure that out. And by the way, some of my projects have committed to being carbon neutral which means I've got to send my data to them, right? I travel for Derek over there. I've got to send him my, my emissions. Well, how do I do that? Do I send it by XML? Do I send him an email file? Do I just do, wait till the end of the year? Well, how does that work, right? So in my head, this is once, once again one of, the, one of the things I'm going through. So, okay, long story short, I will wrap this up, I promise. Um, here's the sheer number of systems that I got through with just my simple flight example. Right, and by the way, this isn't the full list. At some point I actually got bored and I just like stopped drawing boxes. Right, there's actually more than that. Just in the, just in the PwC world, I have at least three, P, three greenhouse gas systems. Because there's a system that we use just for flights, which then rolls up into our corporate system that does all of our greenhouse gas emissions and there's somewhere in there, there's an analytics layer. All right, oh, by the way, what did I now enable myself to go do? I can optimize my business decisions. Okay, arguably my miles is not a business decision, but that's all right, we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. Um, I can quantify my impacts against targets. Why is that important? I'm a science-based target, PwC is, right? We've, we've agreed that we are gonna be net zero. It's something that we've believed in, right? How we'll get there, it'll be interesting. We'll get there as we, as we get there. But now I have a personal view that I need to understand what my impacts are, my own personal impacts, because I'm a partner in the firm, which means I am an owner of the firm of PwC. Therefore, I'm, I believe in that commitment. I believe in that target, which means my miles, my team's miles counts against that target, right? Because as an owner of the company, as a shareholder of that company, I am directly impacted by that target and our ability to hit that target, okay? Communicate to key stakeholders, my own bosses, my, my internal uh, sustainability folks, my customers. And then reconcile this expected versus actual. So I'm really fascinated by this. I really want to understand how different is the number because certain airlines actually do like flight optimized landing paths, which allows them to burn less fuel, generate cost savings, but actually burns less CO2. And once again, as I think about this, this is once again how my world works. Think about OFP and the ecosystem that needs to exist in those 12 orange boxes. Think about the sheer number of travel and expense systems that are existing out there. Think about all the solutions to go get data from my farmers and my meat menu, you know, my, my, my uh, meat suppliers, the folks that provide like the, the toilet paper and then so on and so forth, right? Just imagine all of that data. Think about the ledgers involved, right? All the spend data if you're doing scope three. Think about the allocation systems, right? For SAF, that is. 
flight systems, so on and so forth. You get the idea, right? So how does OFP fit in all this? Right? And so once again, as you think about over the next three days, as we get into OFP, this is what's, once again, what's literally rattling through my head. Scary, I know. Okay, wrap it up. So I wanted to take you through that journey. One, to share a bit of my own personal view of why I'm involved in this whole OFP space, right? Because for me, it is, it is a personal issue that I do believe in. Number two, I do believe that there are business decisions that can be made and enabled, but it's not, it's not gonna be easy. Right? I can take the easy route. I can just go to Google, I can go to Kayak and take the number down and write it down and go, I'm done. You know, but I kind of hate that answer. Right? The engineer in me really hates the fact that it isn't complete. And now that I work for an accounting firm, I really hate it apparently, because I'm an engineering and accountant and really hates the fact that it's incomplete. I really hate the fact that it's not representative actuals, because I know we have the data out there. Right? Like that data exists out there. If I can tap into it, I'd be really curious. Because when I make different decisions, you know, between airlines, depending on how they spend their money on fuel burn, right? Curious. Once again, I'm thinking about the reasons I would make decisions. So as I sit there and I come back and I come back to why do I go through all that? Uh, to me, OFP is kind of fascinating because there's all kinds of use cases for this. And I'm not going to go into all the different details around this, right? But you can imagine end-to-end -end value chain. My description of that farmer giving the pomegranates for my salad, well, that's no different than what you see in the agriculture business as you go buy a carton of milk in your, in your grocery store. Think about the chain, that value chain that exists. Right? Think about in the manufacturing space. I, I'm working for a steel company at the moment. The sheer amount of hops that carbon data has to go through to get my scope one emissions from one of my facilities in Canada to the corporate environmental report to the, sorry, to the site report, because they're in Canada, so they got to do their NPI reporting or NPRI, whatever it is, right? Their Canada reporting to the corporate environmental report to CSRD. Oh, by the way, they also send their product carbon footprint out to the steels that they made. So imagine that one piece of information is now going four or five stops. So think about all the lineage that's involved in tracking that, right? How would I actually track that? How do I keep track of that in OFP across those different hops? By the way, those aren't all one systems. That's that, that, that chain I just described is actually four separate systems that the client has, three separate data lakes. I'm not saying they're the most efficient in using IT. We'll leave that for a different day. Okay, retail, same thing. Travel and hospitality, same thing, right? So as you start to think about this, what's my incentive, right? If I'm some poor farmer that's sitting out there, we talked about this, uh, AJ, last night over the, uh, the, the multiple whiskeys. AJ's brother's a farmer. Why the hell would I give you my number? That's a lot of work. What incentivizes that person to go do that? How can I drop the total cost of ownership down for that person in the value chain to make it easier for them? So hence again, this is why I'm thinking about OFP. Where does OFP fit in my sort of iPhone world where if I go buy my water bottle, some of you have seen my water bottle before, it automatically sinks. I don't have to think about it, don't have to do anything with it. I, I, yes, I'm an IT person, but I don't have to worry about it. I just, it just works. So how can I enable OFP in that kind of end-to-end -end value chain, right? Making products, right? So steel, metals, I gave you my example earlier. Energy, right? Think about it, oil field services. By the way, that's what a lot of our oil field services folks are doing right now. They're thinking about how they make products so that they can provide the lowest carbon footprint product to Shell or to Equinor or to Exxon or to whatever it is because they think that's competitive advantage for them versus their, their peer group, right? So how do they use that data in a highly verifiable way. No different than, by the way, what we did with safety, right? Most of you in the oil and gas business, right? If you use your handsets while you're driving, you get fired. You uh, have a bad safety issue, you're, you're getting fired. Like, just be bad, just be blunt about it, right? Like, I'm not saying that in a bad way, but safety became a defining, a defining principle as whether you work or not. I, I can see carbon, I can see sustainability heading that same way. It already is in some cases, not in all cases, and I'm not, once again, no judgment there, but that's where it's headed, right? So think about how I can now start to do the scenario analysis. Would you pay a million dollars more for a lower carbon product? 
how do I do that scenario analysis? What are the scenario analysis tools that exist out there in the market, right? So think about your forecasting planning tools that exist in the market. Right now, you guys do this in a financial world. How do those tools and how do those solutions now use OFP to take that same carbon data, incorporate it into other cost figures, other financial figures, and then be able to, re to replicate that? Okay. Sorry. I'm conscious of time. I got two, minute, two more things to say, and then I'll shut up. Financing. Doing a project right now for a big bank. Well, they're fascinating, right? They loan a bunch of money to, to some of the companies that are sitting in the room here today. How do they get their emissions, your emissions? Right, think about it. Because when you think about finance emissions, effectively when they send you a loan for, I don't know, whatever, a billion dollars, they're effectively taking your emissions Dividing by the total market cap, multiplying times the size of the loans. I'm very simplifying PCAF here for the moment, so let's, let's, not, let's not fact check me on that math. How do they get that number? Right? Because it's not easy, once again. If you think about a bank that has to issue millions and millions of loans, they can't just sit there and have some poor associate that's going to go out there and collect that data on a daily basis. Right? So think about the technology that's involved in gathering the data for every business, every personal consumer, if you're a consumer bank, and being able to account for that in my financed emissions. And think about all of the different systems in the room. If I did a poll right now, I can guarantee you I can probably count at least a dozen different greenhouse gas systems that are being used just in this room alone. So think about a bank trying to get that data. Or think about a private equity company or even the energy companies represent. Think about your, your non-operative ventures. Think about your OBOs, your, whatever, your JVs. Right? How do you get that data? Because right? it's not easy. Right? So how do, I, how do I make this easier for third parties to go get this information? How do I make those decisions with limited information? Because I'm not always going to get the level of granularity that I will with my operational data. And then my technology guys, because I have to throw this in, because somewhere I have to have a slide that says Gen AI. I'm pretty sure it's in my contract somewhere. Um, the use of computing technology. Got in a big debate around cloud migrations. Got in a big debate around data centers, right? Um, how are we enabling the use and calculations of emissions that are associated to the technology companies? Social media. I just posted something on LinkedIn. Do I have a carbon footprint? I don't know. Um, using cloud, using AI. So anyways, once again, I go through all of these things because these are the different use cases that at least I see at a personal level where I see OFP. And by the way, me as well as my firm does, that OFP can do. Because once again, if you think about all the orange boxes here, just with my one flight, think about all of the orange boxes that are involved in all of these use cases across all of the companies that are represented by those sectors. And that's a significant amount, right? So once again, we're not going to solve that overnight. But just something for us to think about as you think about your use cases, as you're out there as leaders in your business, as employees of your organizations, as personal consumers, how do we share, communicate, and transmit that? that, that. By the way, this is just carbon. We haven't even talked about water, waste, microplastics. <laughs> you know, inclusion, uh, I don't know, whatever else is in the CSRD reporting cycle. I don't know, there's 1,100 metrics somewhere in there that I'm sure I'll read at some point, but I'm not gonna worry about that for today. So anyways, OFP use cases, hopefully a, a decent representation of all the things at least that we can and could do with this. So sorry for a bit of a whirlwind tour around that, but uh, yeah, appreciate your time. So Jim, back over to you.